Graham. I'm delighted to be joined by Graham Cooper of National Grid here. Um, Graham, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, James. Yes, my name is Graham Cooper. I'm the Project Director for Transport Decarbonisation at National Grid. Fantastic. Now, National Grid, as those of us who have some dealing with National Grid know, is not a monolithic block. There are lots of different bits. You've got yes. the ESO, you've got transmission, etc. Could you explain the structure and where you fit? Right. OK, so um, in the UK, uh, National Grid has three principal businesses. Now, they're all part of National Grid Group. OK, um, and that's a FTSE listed business. So it's a private business. Actually, if you've got a pension, you're probably a part owner of National Grid. We've got 880,000 shareholders, so um, you're probably all an owner in some form if you have a pension. But we have basically three principal chunks of National Grid. There's National Grid Electricity System Operator. So they're the team that effectively manage the real-time supply and demand. They forecast when energy is going to turn up, they forecast when energy is going to be demanded and balance that in real time. So they're the, they're the folks that keep the lights on uh, and keep that running. Now, that became a legally separate business in April last year. Then there's the National Grid Ventures. Now, National Grid Ventures in the UK is, is the, the sort of the non-regulated bit. They're interested in things like, um, well, actually, what they're building right now is the, the interconnector between the UK and Norway. So they, yeah. they're paying half, Norwegians pay half. It's a, it's a private business, but it's part of the group. And then there's the what's left, really, which is actually the biggest part of National Grid, which is um, uh, Enget, which is the business that, that owns the electricity transmission system. So the big pylons and substations in England and Wales. But we also own the gas transmission system in England, Wales and Scotland. But because we're a monopoly, you know, no one else does exactly what we do. Um, we're massively regulated by Ofgem. You know, we, we, we have to jump through an awful lot of hoops and, and run under an awful lot of scrutiny. Um, but also under the nature of our licence, we're technically agnostic. So although you'll hear in my title that I'm decarbonisation of transport, it's not electrification of transport. So we can cover anything from, you know, electricity, hydrogen, biofuels, synthetic fuels, and anything in between. So, um, I guess that probably means that I'm in quite a unique position because I'm not in that sort of tribal, it's either electrify everything or hydrogenize everything. There's actually a blend of everything in there. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's where National Grid plays the role. Fantastic, great stuff. Um, and your own background, as uh, we know, you're obviously uh, pretty, pretty keen on renewables. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, but very briefly, I'm in, I'm in my third career, right? My, I, when I graduated university, we were in the last recession, the, the, the late 1990s recession. I'm older than I look. Um, and, I, and basically, I spent the first 10 years of my career building mobile phone networks across Europe. Now, if you think about that as a technology, it was a technology disruptor, pushed by government, pulled by consumer, with a strong infrastructure play. Then, really, as I got a bit older, started a family, wanted a job with some sort of uh, at least ethical consideration, something my kids would be proud of me doing. So I got into the wind industry. I spent about 11 or 12 years in the wind industry. Uh, I worked for a Norwegian company called Fred Olsen Renewables, and I was part of a team and built half a billion pounds of the wind farms in Scotland. So eight large scale commercial wind farms. Um, and I also was involved in the development of um, a large offshore wind farm in the Irish Sea called Codling Wind Park. But that meant that through that period, um, I was the, the customer of National Grid. So I'm kind of the fox in the hen house, as it were. But um, what I'd also say is um, I also take my work home with me. So um, I live in a, a 600 year old house. Um, it's a, a grade two star listed house. So it's a house of national importance, which is actually effectively carbon neutral. So I, I buy 100% renewable electricity from Octopus in this instance. Um, I have two EVs. I've got a plug-in hybrid Volvo and a Tesla battery electric. Um, I have ground source heat pumps, so my garden helps heat my house. Um, and actually, we even treat all our own, own wastewater. So um, we treat that on site. So the only thing that leaves my home, the only environmental impact my home has, is we expel clean water. So I'm paid to do this, but I also do it at home. So, um, so I guess that's me. But that also led me into working for National Grid, because having been a customer of National Grid, um, if we think about the transition to transport, it's a technology disruptor pushed by mm -hmm. government, pulled by consumer with a significant infrastructure play. So it sounds familiar. That's me.
Absolutely. Fantastic. Um, great stuff. And you've slightly transitioned uh, recently. You were the project director for electric vehicles, but it's now specifically, as you say, uh, decarbonisation. So you've got that broader scope at the moment. So a um, bit of a focus on some other transport uh, away from just the vehicles at the moment. Yeah, so the so the well the realization was the first and fastest moving bit of transport decarbonization was the domestic car, right? You know, the technology was always already there. It's a transition phase. When you start to look at the I mean the dirtiest thing we do as a country, right, is is twenty seven percent of our carbon emissions come from moving people and goods. Now that that's even overtaken electricity production. So all the way since the industrial revolution, the dirtiest thing we did was make energy. That transitioned in about 2016, 2017. And that's not because transport got dirtier, it's because making energy got cleaner. But if you think about the journey to net zero, actually electrifying cars or cleaning domestic cars is actually really easy. It's not easy, but out of all the things we need to do, it's probably the easiest thing. But really the role National Grid can play in this is you know, the difficult to do stuff. So, so I'm now taking what we've been learning for the last two or three years in trying to help um, you know, cars and like vans, trying to help that learning into road, rail, you know, larger road, so trucks and buses, and then rail, aviation and maritime. Because ultimately, those are the more difficult to do things on the journey to net zero. So there is a bit of a method in the madness, um, but it, it hopefully makes some sense because ultimately you can't think of transport decarbonisation in silos. You can't just do cars and then say you're done. Yeah. You need to kind of use that as a stepping stone. So Absolutely. that's why I own that broad subject. Fantastic. Well, we're going to keep you on an easier uh, part of your job today on the, on the vehicles. Okay. And um, it is easy, uh, but I guess it's, or at least it's easy, yes, but it's still occupying us, I have to say. It's, it's going to be oh, a kind of a growth phase. Um, so the first thing I'd like to ask you about a bit, a bit is the uh, impact of uh, coronavirus, COVID-19 uh, national grid. So uh, we've certainly seen very, very substantially reduced demand on the system um, through this period. That may be slightly coming back as we come out of lockdown. Yeah. Um, how have national grid coped with that? Well, actually, can I take that in two pieces? There's the Please how work. have national grid and employees coped? And then there's the how has the system coped? So I think that, and they're two very distinct things. So um, we have um, gas control rooms and we have electricity control rooms. What was really important from a national grid perspective is we actually islanded our electricity control room staff. Within the first couple of days of lockdown, we, we bought sleeping pods in and actually people literally were in an airlock. They went inside the control room and they remain there for about nine weeks. So wow. some people made some significant sacrifices mm. um, um, just to make sure that the, the, the light stayed on and the, and the gas stayed running. So I think, you know, we've not, been, we've not shouted about it, but there are some people who've made some massive sacrifices uh, of being stranded away from their, their families. So um, how have we coped as a business? We're a very resilient, you know, important to the national economy, we have to keep the lights on. And actually, it's been quite impressive as an employee to see how we've done that. So that was mm. that sort of piece. So, um, you know, as a business, pretty much everything has kept running. Only things that were impacted were for about two weeks, any practical work, so upgrading transformers, pulling power lines, those sort of things, were paused for about two weeks, only till we could put in safe methods of work so we could continue. So really, from a national grid perspective, Corona is only slowed us down by about two weeks in reality. But actually, when you start to look at the energy side, huge impact on the energy system. So we've had lots of high wind, lots of sunny periods, low demand. And that's actually seen some significant challenges on, on the system. Now, that's principally done by the electricity system operator, but you know it's, it's in the public domain, so happy to sort of talk about it. So we've seen tremendous periods of negative pricing. Um, you know, there's, there's two ways in which there's two sides of the equation. You, you can either turn power generation up or down to meet demand, or you can turn demand up or down to meet generation. Now, typically, it's been generation turning up or down to meet demand that just is doing what demand does. But through digitization, through um, transiting technology or new, new evolving technology, there is the ability that you know, the car can actually help the energy system. And actually, this is really, really quite important. And why you see from the government's EV Energy Task Force, they talk about mandating smart charging. So what you see is, 
If you can manage when charging happens, and I'm sure you appreciate this, but maybe not everyone does, but the grid is cleaner or dirtier throughout the day. And if there's more energy on the system, then the energy price is lower. So actually you can make car charging and electric heating much, much cheaper and cleaner by timing when that happens. So actually what we've started to see is a huge growth in those offering demand side management. So whether that's somebody like um, Octopus trialing agile tariffs, so paying you to consume energy, um, people trying to exercise smart charging. So we've seen Obviously, you've been running some interesting stuff trying to, to, to make this work. We've had other competitors to you trying this sort of stuff as well. And everybody's trying to work out how best to do that. But what it does do is it creates that real symbiotic relationship. When I was a wind farm, the last thing I did before I joined National Grid was try to finance a wind farm without a feeding, you know, without the, the renewables obligation. And the problem is, if you're making a lot of energy and it's worth less or worth next to nothing. It doesn't matter how much you make. You know, the numbers on your spreadsheet start to go red quite quickly. Yeah. And that makes it really difficult to borrow 150 million pounds to build a wind farm. So where we need to get to in a real smart way is if we can get smart charging, that managed charging to work really, really well, then those offering the smart charging will be able to work with energy retailers to procure PPAs knowing that effectively you've got a price floor you know, at what point would you just dump energy into hot water cylinders for heating and into car batteries? So what you end up doing is if we can, what we're really learning at great pace in this period is how smart can smart consumption be to help the upstream generation? So I mean, it's a really long answer to a relatively simple question, but it's been huge. I mean, the, the advance in learning is massive. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. So I guess I went into the question thinking it will tell us a tale of woe. And I have to say we had a, uh, uh, we're all massively in debt to that team who've been locked away for nine weeks. I mean, those are real key workers. But I yes. guess from those of us interested in a, a, a more renewable system or demand side response, it's been a, a you know a sandbox basically for a lot of these yes, technologies. Definitely, um, and it's great to hear you say that because you know that that has always been a key uh, a core part of PopPoint strategy as well, using smart charging as as demand side response. Um, so thank you very much indeed for for for, for that answer. Um, I mean, now we're going to move on to, to uh, mass electrification. So, so we're pretty bullish uh, uh, about the uh, success of electric vehicle through, through the 2020s up to the 2030 sort of uh, uh, time frame. Um, and I believe you are as well, Graham, because my first experience of you was at uh, a, a session at Parliament where, where you were asked for a, for a potential date for a phase out of, uh, of petrol cars. And, and you said something which was, uh, I think you said 2030. And then someone said, really, National Grid would back that. And you seem to say yes to that. So I'm going to ask you now, yeah. um, 2035 phase-out date is the current proposal. Would that come forward five years? from uh, When you were in that session, it was 2040. Yes. What date would you back now? Can I answer the... I need to give you some context for the first one before I answer the second Please one. So do. this is my, pol my politician's answer. So the question actually levelled at me was... If the date were to come forward, could National Grid cope? Mm -hmm. And my response was yes. And then they said, what? Even if it went to 2030? And my response was yes. So it was not me. I was very careful with my words. And we've even had our guys look through the script to say, was National Grid back in 2030? I had to be very, very careful. Um, but I guess the, the, the smart thing from my perspective is because the energy system, right, we, the, the whole energy system works on the basis of diversity. Not everybody does everything at the same time. And the system has sort of been built historically for what is the peak demand of energy plus headroom. So if you think about that, that's likely to be week before Christmas, really low pressure, dark, wet and cold, massive you know, level of demand, and then headroom. So that's how the system has traditionally been built. So actually, most of the time, the energy system is not under duress, right? I mean, look at us now. I mean, you and I are chatting now. The time now is, well, half past three. It's a Tuesday. Loads of sun in the sky. It's quite breezy out. Demand is low. Right, the, the system is running at maybe 20% of, its, of its, its theoretical capacity. 
But what a great time to be putting energy into cars, and into, into, into heating, right? Um, but you wouldn't necessarily want to do charging lots of cars and filling lots of hot water tanks full of, of, of hot water for 5.30 till 7.30 on a cold winter's evening. Yeah. So what it tells you is that actually with smart charging and smart management, we can get pretty much all the electrification of transport we need onto the system without it being a huge change. Now that's not saying there won't be new generation, but what new generation is coming? I mean, let's, 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 let's actually, let's work on some hard numbers here, right? So we can do this two ways. I think from when you and I spoke before, if you look at about 2002 was the highest demand we had on the system, right? Um, and that was about 64 gigawatts. Now, what we've seen since 2002 is a gentle softening of demand. Now, we've got more and more electrical gadgets, but they're more and more efficient. Yeah, so, so LED bulbs, etc. LED things, bulbs. Yeah. I mean, LED bulbs has a huge impact on the system. But also on top of that, people are generating their own. So when we see demand, we see it as negative demand. So if you're making your own electricity... We're not counting what you're making. That's just demand we're not supplying. So the combination of growth and domestic solar, more efficient homes, more efficient devices, we've seen that fall. So since 2002 to probably last year, that was about a 16% fall in consumption. If we made all the cars in the UK electric, we only go back up to about where we were in 2002. And nearly all of those generators are still there that were there in 2002. Admittedly, there are one, if you're gonna get into the detail, there are one or two coal plants that aren't there and there's a gas plant that's not there and right. So, but what we've also got is more renewables, so more wind and solar on the system. So that's the snapshot looking backwards. But if you look forward from today, government signed the offshore wind sector deal. So in the UK, we are pioneers globally. We've got the most deployed offshore wind anywhere. So we're real pioneers in offshore wind. So at the moment today, we're just shy of 10 gigawatts of offshore wind in the UK. The offshore wind sector deal says we're going to have 30 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030. And that could be as much as 40 gigawatts by 2030. Now, that growth in renewables in, in offshore wind is going to be likely to run faster than we can buy electric cars faster than we can deploy ground source heat pumps. Mm. So on, on that sort of general pub argument, which is, oh, we can't do this, the grid can't cope. I call, f I call foul, right? Um, you know, we've managed the transition to go all of this wind on the system, the retirement of, of you know, um, coal and gas plants. I mean, when I started in the wind industry, crikey, 15, 16 years ago, I was told by National Grid that you could never have more than 5% renewables on the grid because it would be too unstable. Well, over lockdown, we've run the country for whatever it was, how many hundred days without coal? Um, we've had days where we've had 60, 70, even 80% renewables running the system. And guess what? The lights stayed on. So, you know, there's learning and growing experience in all of this. So it really is the grid can't cope. And the grid can cope. The challenge will be... As you know, um, you know, if you take a typical domestic house, um, you know, standard single phase, sort of 80 kilowatt type supply. Um, if you add a- 80 amp. Oh, sorry, 80 amp yeah. supply. Sorry, yeah, you're the engineer, I'm not. Yeah, Whoa, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry, 80, 80 amp supply. You know, if you look at the typical consumption and you add an EV, you can almost double the consumption, the electrical consumption of the house. Now that's fine if, you don't burst your 80 amp fuse, right? And it's well, okay some, in the street. Some of us have load management technologies which help you in the background. Yeah. Well, well, this, well it, that's going to actually get really, really important because the one thing that's interesting for me is, is, is my house, I've got ground source heat pumps. And the one thing that was a real surprise to me is I thought with having two plug-in vehicles that they would be the biggest demand on energy on my home. No. Yeah. I use eight times more energy to heat my home than I do filling my cars. The reason being is I heat water multiple times a day because, well, we heat the house and need it for domestic hot water. But I charge my battery electric car once a week. Mm. But the challenge is just think of a world where, um, you know, the first step is decarbonisation of transport and we can all slowly get to a point where we have cars and some smart load technology will keep the street running. 
But what happens in four or five years' time when your gas boiler blows up and you say, well, I'm going to have me a heat pump? Mm-hmm. Well, electrically, a heat pump looks pretty much the same as a car charger. So you're into that challenge that if you follow that sort of typical business school stuff, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, people will go for food and shelter first. Mm -hmm. Well, can you imagine people will choose heating over travel, right? So there could be an increased opportunity to load manage between not just the grid and load to car charging, but there could be your charger talking to your heating system so that you don't try and charge your car whilst your heat pump's trying to run. So not only is there an avoided cost of grid that you could save, but you could play into that very cleverly. So it's one of those things Mm. that I think people are not necessarily seeing yet, but that load management stuff will become really important. So in streets, there could be one or two headaches, but that's a case of upgrading fuses and cables. But broadly, the grid can cope. Yeah. Fantastic. And, and Graham, this is one of the reasons I wanted to have a chat with you, because um, you know, we, we all see the comment sections and, and the Twitter comments under things where we go, oh, but what happens when everyone goes electric, the grid can't cope? And my point is, have you ever asked them? You know, the, like, national grid do exist. You can, they're, they're modelling this. I mean, your future we energy this, yeah. Yeah, um, and I, yeah, I always find your, your answers rather compelling. Your, your 2002 stat, I think, is, is a real killer. Uh, it's a hell of an answer to what your date you, you'd have the phase out of electric vehicles because <laughs> it didn't include a date. Uh, so I'm going to push no. you for one now. Are you, can you do that, or is politician Graham not allowed to say? 